Hello, BookTube. It's Friday, and that means Friday Reads, uh, when a whole bunch of BookTubers make videos uh, talking about the books they've read recently, the books that they're going to read. Uh, Sean the Book Maniac goes outside, <laughs> and I, I want to do the same thing. I want to show you some books uh, that I've read recently and, uh, and chat with you a, a little bit about them. We'll start off with an oldie. This is a Star Trek novel, the original series Star Trek novel. This is Sanctuary by John Borholt. Uh, and it's, I don't remember when this is from, but, oh, oh, I lost it. Uh, this is, uh, as you can tell from the cover, this is set in the original five-year voyage of the Starship Enterprise. No bloody A, B, C, or D. Uh, and the thing that I, I mean, I have read it when it came out in the, in the 80s or the early 90s or whatever, and I liked it enough. Warnholt can't write to save his life, but uh, you don't go to these books usually for the writing. <laughs> uh, and I... I liked it well enough and totally forgot about it, so I, I have an e-book of it and I read it again, just cause. <laughs> I think I think I, the main reason that I read it is because uh, it's been a while since I got a new Star Trek novel. There are a couple that have come out every month, and I haven't I haven't gone looking for the new Star Trek novel. I especially like uh, the TOS, the original series. I especially like those, and there's usually one of those a month at least, and I I know there must be one. For now, for now about, it's February or March, but I haven't, I haven't gone looking for it and I had the itch. So I, I reread this thing. The thing I liked about it is, I mean, it's a standard, you know, one planet adventure. None of, there's not a whole lot of great character moments, but the thing that's distinctive about it anyway is that the main trio of the show, the original series, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, are stranded together on a planet. So you don't have to worry about one of those characters somewhere else. They're all three together, and it gives Vornhold a chance, anyway, to to write their great chemistry. The chemistry between those two, those three characters, is really the heart and soul of the original Star Trek. I could wish, maybe, that that chemistry were captured a little better, but it made for... Uh, oh, oh, it made for a, a pretty good little reading moment. And the same thing with this next one, which I just recently got. This is Dr. Nye by Joseph Lincoln who's a, a Cape Cod author. Uh, and this this is the story of a man who left his Cape Cod village uh, under a cloud of disgrace for having embezzled money and uh, comes back fully cognizant of the fact that villages have long memories and that they can be brutal places they don't usually forgive. And uh, I remembered most strongly about this book. There's a, a sort of a romantic subplot that happens, and I remembered that most strongly. Uh, but I loved it. Just loved the reading experience. I'm firmly starting to believe now that there's more to this author than meets the eye. Certainly more. He always said, I write uh, what we would now call feel-good books. He said, I write pleasant books about recognizable, pleasant people. I know perfectly well. He knew perfectly well the literary strains of the day, and he intentionally didn't write in those strains. He just wanted to write simple and ultimately uplifting stories. And boy, oh boy, I, he succeeded with me. I really like this. I want to get this thing to work. There we go. And the next one is Come Fly the World. I've mentioned this before to you. Uh, I gave it the, the finished copy of Read. This is a story of uh, Pan Am stewardesses, air hostesses. And the, and the remarkable uh, history of that occupation and all the ways in which it was not what you typically think of. You, you typically think of the, the, the way that air stewardesses, the air hostesses are characterized in the literature of the day, for instance, is hardly better than brainless flying nymphomaniacs. Whereas Pan Am had a whole institute and the women that measured up to be their ambassadors to the world, their ambassadors to their customers, the customers weren't talking to the pilot. This was before GPS. The pilot was busy flying the plane. They, they talked to these people. These women had to be poised, confident. They had to be often multilingual. They had to be professionals in every sense of the word. And I, it's maybe their story has been told before and I've just missed it, but I was halfway through this book and I was thinking, why has no one read written this story before? I loved it. Thought it was fantastic. Uh, the same thing is true with this one, The Barbizon, uh, a story of a residential hotel and the, the all the different kinds of women who went to live there and found themselves curiously liberated by, at heart, at least at the beginning, by having their own address. 
Uh, but then so much more develops. And boy, oh boy, who is the author here? Paulina Bren? I don't think I've ever read her before. But boy, oh boy, can she capture characters. <laughs> this, it, it, it reads like... Uh, well, the, the typical thing for a reviewer to say is that it reads like fiction. Meaning that it reads really well. That it reads really smoothly and good. I always hesitate to say that because uh, most fiction is horrible and contrived <laughs> so, so, uh, this, but this reads like uh, uh like a half a dozen of these ladies sat down in their seventh decade and told you snappy stories about what their life was like and i again i was uh, halfway through it and i was thinking why has no one written this story before maybe someone has but i loved it absolutely loved it uh okay we're gonna go this way so i'm uh, okay all right then the next one we have is for the gays you gotta give the gays something and um, this is a book called Staccato. This is a magnum opus. There's a magnum opus series of uh, M slash M gay homosexual male on male uh, romance novels uh, set around musical themes. And in this case, the, the uh, main character is the draw here because the main character is a blind music teacher uh, who is... I mean, it's, it's a little bit odd for the school where he teaches. It's a little bit odd and maybe brochure-worthy that they have a blind music professor. But it does make him, as the book opens, it makes him feel a little bit like a, an animal on display. And certainly, the author does a great job of conveying the fact that this character really does feel like most of the doors to any possibility of a, set, of a fulfilling romance have already closed, have long since been closed. So when one comes along, I mean, it's a, it's a classic romance novel in that regard. When one comes along, you, the reader, and this is no small thing. Plenty of writers try to create this effect and fail. But when an opportunity comes along, another musician, a very different musician from our main character, when that opportunity comes along, because of the job that, that E.M. Lindsay has done, you're holding your breath, too. Your heart is racing, too, wondering if it's going to work. Because by the time it starts to surface, you have come to care about uh, the curiously vulnerable main character here. So I, I highly recommend it. And I recommend, uh, I'm trying off the top of my head to remember the name of the first book. I read it. Uh, it might have been in one of these Friday reads. It also has a musical term as a title. Uh, but I'm, I'm blanking. I'm blanking on the name of the first one. There's only one other. This is only book two. And you can read this without reading the first one. So it's a recommend. Uh, then, oh no. <laughs> oh no. I swear. Getting these things to behave. Uh, it would be so nice if right there in YouTube Studio it was insert picture here. Upload from your desktop. Okay, now drag and drop to your video. Okay, where do you want this to be? Drag and drop to your video. Yeah, that'd be so nice. <laughs> but, but let's see if we can get this to behave. We have, we have Dr. Nye, Come Fly With Me, The Barb is On, Staccato. There we go. Okay, The Rebel. This is a romance novel. It's not for the gays, although let's be honest. The gays are going to read something like this and really like it. And you might be able to tell from that little sigil up on the top, this is a hockey romance. There's a subgenre of romance novels, the sports romance. And one of the sub subgenres of that subgenre is hockey romances. And that just mystifies me it just mystifies me i mean yes one in ten thousand professional hockey players will look like Sidney crosby did when he was in his 20s once in ten thousand most of the rest of them when they're in their early 20s look like me <laughs> only with no teeth I, they seem as unlikely suspects for romance heroes as do uh, amish man uh, a range riding cowboy in the modern sense of the word they don't seem heroic at all and or romantic at all and that's this story this is a, a classic type of romance novel where the main characters especially the man they they have a combustible interaction years ago before the action of the novel opens and they both assume for different reasons that it it is not real that it is not permanent and that it can never be resumed that is a standard gimmick in romance novels. I myself tend to like it. Uh, I don't go to romance novels for originality. I don't go to any fiction for originality. Uh, and I, I, uh, the thing that I liked about this one was how credibly wounded the man, the male, male main character seems. He's got the usual brick hard exterior, but he seemed to me to be genuinely smarting from the end of that relationship. 
Uh, and that made you, again, once again, it's not an easy thing to do if you're an author to produce this response. But once again, it made me root for this romance to take root a second time and work. Uh, okay, we have another romance. <laughs> this is, I hate these uh, loopy script titles because the, I can never tell what they are. This one is actually called Meant to Be. It's by Jude Devereaux, who is who has been writing mainstream romance novels since the Norman Conquest. She's just got a two hundred thousand romances to her name, as she knows everything to do, and could easily coast on her name. Uh, and yet, the last book that she wrote, Met Her Match, I think was the name of it, was absolutely terrific. It was absolutely true. It was the best thing I've ever read from this author. I've read a lot from this author, and this was terrific too. It's almost as if. This, this author has just decided, well, you know, instead of resting on my laurels or going straight for stupid cliches, I'm going to write one really good book every year. I, I don't know this author. I have no idea. But one way or another, uh, I think Met Her Match was the name of the book. That really stood out. And this one does too. This is about two sisters and follows them over the course of, of years where they are trying to decide, in one sense, what is, according to the title, meant to be. What is the path their lives are supposed to take? Uh, and the book wonderfully goes long, long stretches without tying that, the question of that, of the fate of these two sisters to any man. It, 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 the book goes for long, wonderfully refreshing stretches just talking about their lives. Wondering about the choices that they're going to make, professionally and personally, but not necessarily only romantically. Which, for a long time, in most in most romance novels, would be the only dimension that you would get. So, that was very refreshing. This one wasn't as funny as the previous one, but still really, really good. Very much enjoyable. Uh, we're going to keep going. Alright, this one you've seen already. I got this just the other day. Uh, this is Lee's Lieutenants, Volume 1, by Douglas Southall Freeman, who wrote... A big, huge, multi-volume biography of George Washington. A big biography of Robert E. Lee. And this is his three-volume history. Basically, a history of the Confederate side of the, the American Civil War. Told through a series of biographical portraits of the generals and lieutenants and whatnot. That commanded men in the field. Uh, and I was blown away. I, I read that trilogy decades ago. And then found this first volume and thought, I haven't read it in a long time. I'm seeing all these vintage Civil War titles on Bill Rutenberg's channel, the Rutenberg Library, might as well. If I found it for dirt cheap, I might as well read it again. I was blown away by the scholarship. And also by the, the austere, really spiky, good prose. I won me over completely. I now want this trilogy. I want a box set of this trilogy. I, I, it is now a, a Civil War thing that I want to have. And it's, I confess, kind of whetted my appetite for other Civil War stuff. For instance, I, there's a classic called Stonewall in the Valley. I don't have it. And there are others, too. There, there are uh, studies of all sorts of things, all sorts of uh, battles and subject matters that I don't have. I don't have a, a really good basic Civil War library. And these things are starting to whet my appetite for it, so maybe. I think I, think I can stop short of a multi-volume biography of Robert E. Lee. Thanks very much. But military studies like Stonewall in the Valley, I used to have a copy of that. Annotated it to a fairly well. No idea what happened to that copy. I went looking for it. When I was finished with this one, I went looking for my copy of that book, and it's gone. So either it fell apart, or I gave it away, or something or other. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this works. Oh, it does. <laughs> How beautiful we were. This is by Mbolo Mbue, uh, who I mentioned in another video today. And she has a short story in the latest New Yorker. Uh, and this is a, a full-length book. And I, I got to this one before the short story, and really liked it really good uh, a voice that's not like anything that i've encountered in contemporary fiction in a little while which is rare enough the the uh wishy-washiness of it the self-impressed nature of it the the obvious fact that the author thinks that they are cooler than sliced bread uh the total lack of any narrative structure the total absence of any satisfying narrative ending I was expecting all of those things. But one thing, because that's normal. Those things are normal. When you have, when every single item on the new fiction list of any publisher is coming out of an extremely coddled, hothouse flower, greenhouse of MFA programs where the writers are never told anything wrong. Where they are coddled and loved and reaffirmed and include and intersectioned and whatever until they can barely see straight. Naturally, the end products of an endless array of programs like that is going to have all of those faults. 
because those faults are the typical things that are fixed by revision and authors coming out of today's MFA programs they'll sue you if you even say the word revision even if you say it in connection with something else if you say hey did you know the US Constitution was heavily revised they'll say I'm sorry I heard the word revised so my lawyer will be in touch with your lawyer I don't even want to hear that word spoken in my presence but one thing you won't find given all of those flaws is voice voice is very hard to come by harder I would say in nonfiction than in fiction but still the devil's own nuisance to come by at all <clears throat> and I think this author has achieved it I don't know if it'll last but I am I've read a book now and a short story I am totally up for uh, for more uh, from from this author we shall see uh, then this one is uh, last call by Elon Green this is something I don't usually read this is a true crime novel uh, about a serial killer of gay men about 40 years ago it's called the last call killer uh, who's preying on gay men so the, the the case was shunted to the sidelines the reporting was weird the the attention was weird because just like with the AIDS epidemic there was a temptation on the part of large swaths of middle America and also the Bible Belt to say who cares because the victims deserved it uh, and to his credit, this author takes that squarely on. This is not just a story about that serial killer and the, the crimes and the, the victims. This is also a story about how you cover those sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, And I, I ordinarily don't read uh, much in the way of true crime because it, it just seems to me so voyeuristic. Most, most of the time, the authors put up a front of being these gruff, trench coat wearing, you know, collar up just the facts ma'am type people when it's clear that they just want to peek inside the refrigerator most of the time that's that's the impression that I get so I, I and that tends to bother me it tends to creep me out so I I tend not to uh, pay th this genre much attention but this one I really liked and I didn't do that uh, is this working ah yes okay this one we've seen on this channel this is the new historical novel from Stephen Pressfield uh, I don't think it's quite out yet but it's the it's set in Roman times. It's set in the very earliest decades of the new Christian religion, and the main character is a Greek mercenary, who is scorned by the Roman soldiers who populate this novel from one end to another because he works for money, and they tell themselves that they don't, and he's uh, scorned and feared by the civilians all around him too because he's clearly what the title says. He's clearly extremely proficient at killing. And they're not, and they, you know, at least with a Roman soldier, you know the structure of accountability. With a with a mercenary, you have no idea. You half the the civilian characters in this novel expect him to help them, out of altruism, which is a silly thing to expect a mercenary to do, and the other half expect them to hurt him to hurt them, out of out of a mercenary's cold cold heart or whatnot. Uh, and the growth of the character, faced with all of that surrounded on almost all sides by hostility or misunderstanding is tremendous just tremendous uh i have i've read everything that stephen pressfield has written i've never read anything like this he's famous for gates of fire a historical novel that he wrote 30 years ago and this is a, an older and much wiser novel uh lots and lots of stuff folded into very quick lines and very quick scenes i it will if you're a fan of historical fiction uh th this will repay your attention uh no no we went that way already let's go this way there we go <laughs> all right this was uh, the major disappointment for our friday read this is uh bruce grayson wrote a book called after he is uh i think a psychiatrist with many decades of experience and this book is about uh ndes it's about near-death experiences and the subtitle is a doctor explores what near-death experiences reveal about life and beyond and unfortunately the book has a lot to say on that it's not totally unequivocal uh, but it was still frustrating uh, because when you examine a near-death experience you are examining chemicals firing in a human brain you are not examining anyone getting a glimpse of an alternate dimension because you can't prove that alternate dimensions exist there's no consistent account of them and the experience of the chemicals firing in a brain that is the only explanation for a near-death experience can be simulated in a healthy person from a standing start without trauma <laughs> and then you can control when the, when the experience ends that person will come out of that experience and report roughly speaking the same archetypal architecture 
of the experience that everybody else has because that's what it is. That's why there's a commonality here. It's not because there really is an afterlife full of de-aged relatives and dead pets waiting for you. It's because we all have the same brain chemistry. And this author knows that. He has to know that. He has to know that this is not a book in any way about what lies beyond death. And yet, there's, there's a billion dollar industry out there of people who will buy your book if you give them hope that there's something beyond death. And it's gotta be there something. And it doesn't matter that it can't be verified. It, it, it's, if, if, if you can take a human being with a normal brain chemistry and induce this experience intentionally, and then bring it to a close, wait a week until they've recovered and induce it again, you have every reason to believe that it is self-contained within the human brain and no reason to believe it isn't. <laughs> Much less to believe that it is a some sort of spiritual experience deriving from the one religion that you were raised in. Christians don't ever see Lord Shiva. <laughs> no one alive today sees Horus or Osiris. No one does. But people who fell off a scaffolding or got hit by a jar 5,000 years ago did see Horace. <laughs> so, anyway, anyway this, was, this was the main disappointment. The author has a way with prose. If, you're, if you are deeply interested in this subject, then, you know, the book will be in your bookstores. I think it might be out already. Uh, this might be a book that you would want to include if you're, if you're already deeply interested in the subject. <sighs> it didn't get along with me. I don't think we have many more to go. Oh, no, this is the last one. Uh, this is the last one. This is Transient Desires. This is the 30th Commissario Brunetti novel set in Venice by Donna Leone. The 30th, the 30th Brunetti adventure. Uh, and it has a great premise, like all of them do. Almost all of them. A couple of them that just, that just were flat puddings from the beginning all the way to the end. But in this one, uh, a quartet of, of people are boating out on the lagoon. And they have a, a, a horrible accident. Two men and two women. And two women are very badly hurt and rush to the hospital. And the men flee. They don't want to stick around. They don't want to stay at the hospital. They don't, you know, they're not later loitering in the waiting room wondering what's going to happen. And that immediately strikes Brunetti as really odd. That strikes him as the behavior that would happen if this was, in fact, a thwarted murder rather than a serious accident. And that's so intriguing in just a basic sense that it, it hooks you right in. Uh, and draws in, as usual with this author, draws in all sorts of subjects about Venice as an international port of call, as a, a, a sinusure for refugees and migrants. There are all sorts of, there's always something in these Brunetti novels that isn't just the whodunit murder mystery. There's always something that's a, that's a broader look at some issue facing Venice. And this one's no different and terrific. Amazing that these things are 30 books long and still being this good. It's just amazing. Uh, and there you go. That is Friday Reads. As far as I know, that is it. Let me check just to make sure. Yes, that is it. Those are all the books that I had to show you. Uh, some not so good. Others uh, deep recommends. <laughs> and, and hopefully covering a spectrum that has something for everybody. Uh, so as usual with Friday Reads, I'd like to know what you're working on. What are you reading this weekend? What did you just read? Any Has anything... You know, we're, we're over the halfway point of March. Has anything really stuck out for March? Any reading experiences that just that are those kinds I always talk about on this channel where they're the goal for all of us? All kinds of, no matter what kind of book we read, we're looking for that particular reading experience that just gives us that skin flush thrill, that time annihilating thrill. I've had a couple of those in March. Have you? I'm wondering, you know, how your reading's going now, so feel free to let me know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.